I see that, you know, think, think of a thing like slavery. Slavery is utterly contrary to God's will. And yet, in Paul's time, the great apostle, inspired by the Holy Spirit, never tells one single master to set his slave free. Have you ever thought of that? He just says, treat them kindly and uh, take care of them. Even to Philemon, whose slave was a believer, Onesimus, he doesn't tell him, share your property with him and let him go free. No, he says, take him back as a slave. Paul recognized that there are certain social things which society and the world was not ready to rectify. He didn't approve of slavery. If you had asked Paul's opinion, he'd have told you straight. But he was sensitive to God. Sometimes, you know, we are moved by human compassion. And uh, it's not the compassion of Christ. It's not according to the wisdom of God. And we do things, and they don't necessarily build the church. I see very clearly that just like Noah spent all his energy and all his money and all his time to build the ark because he knew that was the only thing that would remain when all of the world collapsed around him and was destroyed. I see in exactly the same way today. There is only one thing that will remain when the world is destroyed and that is the true church of Jesus Christ. And that's not something big, it's something holy. The Bible ends with the story of another story, but it speaks about the last chapters of the Bible are dealing with the false church and the true church, Babylon and Jerusalem. And if you read carefully, Babylon is called great, the great city 11 times. Babylon is the mega church, the great Babylon, Babylon the great. Jerusalem is called the holy city. You see the difference, one is quantity, the other is quality. That's the difference between the false church and the true church. So if you're impressed by quantity, you'll definitely be a part of Babylon. If you try to build a church and you, increase, you want to increase in numbers and you don't want to make it holy, you'll end up as Babylon without a shadow of doubt. So we need to see, reorient our thinking according to scripture. I don't want to start a crusade against, in India we have a form of slavery still. In many of the villages in India, they don't call it slavery. They call it bonded labor where poor people are made to work for very minimal pay and uh, in the farm and the fields and they uh, keep, have to keep borrowing from their masters until the debt becomes so huge that the masters say, okay, we'll release you from all that debt, but you give yourself and your family uh, that you'll serve us freely and we'll provide you a place to live and food. It's slavery. They don't get any more salary then, they can't go away. They, it's called bonded labor. The government is 100% against it, has passed laws against it. But you think those laws are implemented in these villages? No. So what shall we do when we go to these villages? I'm not going to take a crusade against delivering people from slavery. The need in a country like India is so massive that uh, where in, I mean, folks from a country like this where you don't see that type of need may not, uh, can be moved by compassion. When you see children eating out of garbage bins, that happens all over India. And there are preachers who capitalize on that and show all these pictures and get money out of gullible Christians to fill their pockets. There's only one thing that's gonna remain when Christ comes back and that's the church. You see in Revelation 21, the church, holy city, Jerusalem and this church is something if you want to um, uh, you want to build on the basis of quality and not quantity you have to make Christ our example and our goal and like Paul says in Colossians and that's a great word for me in my own ministry Colossians in chapter 1 he says in verse 28 we proclaim Christ, admonishing every man, teaching every man with all wisdom so that one day we may present every man in my church perfect in Christ. This is my goal, that if God gives me a responsibility in a church, I want to present every one of them perfect in Christ. 
I, if God gives me children, I want every, I want to present every one of them as a disciple of Jesus. I'm not happy with what other people think. You know, so often parents, I tell you, a lot of Christian parents are uh, want to give a good impression before others. Others might, must think that my children are godly. I'll tell you honestly, I couldn't care less. I, when my children were small, I never told them, what will others think if you do this? Or what will others think if you dress like this? You ask your, question, your children questions like that, you've trained them to be hypocrites. I never asked it. I would only say, what does God think about it? Even if nobody sees you, what does God think about this type of attitude or this type of conduct or this type of speech? It's very, very important that we hold our children and our church to the highest. And the main thing is that Jesus emphasized was the hidden life. Everything inward, you know, in the old covenant, the emphasis was on the outward. You got to, there were 613 commandments in the old, 10 of them everybody knows, the 10 commandments. There were 613 altogether and every one of them had to do with something external. The sacrifices were external. So many laws concerning external things. That's why you had a whole army of scribes who were there to explain chapter and verse, how to do this and how to do that. But that which was external in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, Jesus emphasized the inward. You remember in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, murder, you were told in the Old Testament, don't commit murder. I don't have time to show you all that, but you read it in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. You know those chapters. In the Old Covenant, you were told, don't kill. I'm telling you, deal with the root of it, anger. And if you don't get the root of it, anger out of your heart, you can go to hell. In the Old Testament, it was if you murder, you'll be punished. But in the New Testament, it is whoever is angry against his brother and lets that anger come out of his heart, in his mouth, and again out of his mouth, he will be guilty enough to go to hell. And then he said, in the Old Testament, the commandment, Matthew 5, that's what I read was Matthew 5.22. And he said the Old Testament commandment, Matthew 5, 27, was don't commit adultery, but I say go to the root of it. The inward, the thing which nobody can see, just like the anger, that lustful look at a woman. And if you find it like that, pull your eye out of your body. Again, he says, otherwise, your whole body will be thrown into hell. Many people have asked me through the years, Brother Zach, for 40 years, I've heard you speak against anger, and sexually impure thinking more than any other sin. Why do you speak so much against these two? I said, listen to me, I'll tell you. You read Matthew 5, 6, and 7 carefully, and there are many, many sins mentioned there. You know, if you pray to get honor, that's a sin. If you give to get honor, that's a sin. If you judge others, that's a sin. He says, don't be anxious. If you get anxious, that's a sin. If you love money, that's a sin. But out of all the sins, I mean, if you hate your enemies, that's a sin because you've got to love your enemies. Many, many things listened in those three chapters. But out of all the sins that Jesus spoke about, there were only two sins that he said will take you to hell. Read it yourself. Anger and sexually lustful thinking. I see because it's serious, I speak about it. And because hardly anybody else speaks about it. You try and go to any Christian TV program and see if they ever speak about these two sins. Never. Because the pre preachers themselves haven't got any victory over it. They haven't pursued it. And so you have a generation of people sitting in churches who've got totally impure thoughts, who get angry at home all the time and with each other, and they don't even think it is serious. The two most serious sins that Jesus spoke about, not even mentioned. Do you think today's churches are presenting the real Jesus before people? They say we must help the poor. They'll take pictures of some skinny child in Somalia or somewhere and say we should help him. By all means help him. But that's not what Jesus spoke about. And there's so much of misquoting of scripture. You know there are people who quote Matthew 25. I've heard it myself. Matthew 25. It's all because people don't read scripture carefully. Matthew 25, the king will say to those, verse 34, Come inherit the kingdom <clears throat> prepared for you from the foundation of the world. <clears throat> for I was hungry, Matthew 25, 35, and you gave me something to eat. 
This looks like the social gospel, right? I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. And uh, I was naked and you clothed me, Matthew 25, 36. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And people take those verses and show you those pictures of someone eating out of a garbage bin in India or some sick skinny child in Central Africa or um, widows who become prostitutes and all that. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I'm not against anybody helping all these people. But read carefully. Then the righteous will answer, verse 37, Lord, when did we see you hungry and um, feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger? When did we see you sick? And now listen to the answer of Jesus. Very important. All those careless readers of scripture, please pay attention to this one verse. The king will say to them, and I want to misread it first. To the extent that you did it to one of these human beings, you did it to me. That's how most Christians misread it. He said, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine. Do you really believe all human beings are brothers of Jesus Christ? Are you such a heretic? Are you a Christian? Do you who are the brothers of Jesus? Jesus said, those who hear my word and do it. It's the way you treat not human beings. I'm not against your caring for human beings. All I'm saying is that's not what Jesus speaks of here. Be exact in quoting scripture. Don't pass on misquoting of scripture to other people like a lot of preachers do and collect money from them. Inasmuch as you did it to the, one of these brothers of mine, the least of them, you did it to me. This is the real Jesus.